going to go ahead and get started. We're so glad to have you all with us this evening. You can't hear us? Can you hear me now? No? Yes. Okay. We need to speak loudly. So, panel. All right. So, um, thank you. I'm Amy Wineland. I'm the director of Summit County Public Health. We're so thrilled that uh, it's such a great turnout this evening to hear this very uh, super important information. Uh, we're glad to have some high school students here as well, so thanks for showing up, you guys. Um, and thank you to the school for hosting us here tonight. We did a talk last spring, but we want to make sure that we're doing these frequently in our community so that everyone can have this in in information and help uh, prevent deaths uh, in the future. Um, thank you to, to the school for uh, hosting us next week. We're going to be talking to all the high school students um, next Thursday so or Wednesday. I'm really excited about that. It's, actually, it's Tuesday. <laughs> I can't remember what day it is. Um, so we're very excited to have that partnership with our school district. Uh, it's important for this information to also not only be in the hands uh, uh, and toolbox of parents, but also um, for our youth to know this so they can make good decisions for themselves and protect their friends. So we're not going to, oh, awesome, oh, I didn't know we could turn it off. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, and I'm just going to, we have lots of, uh, support for the slides and the data that is that you'll be seeing tonight. Um, topics covered this evening, we do have several speakers, so we're going to start off with Dr. Rob Valak. He's the director of the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. And then uh, we're going to watch a short video about fentanyl. Then we're going to have Matt Riviere, he's here for, um, to share his story about his two sons and the loss uh, due to accidental poisoning from fentanyl-laced pills. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about some data and what parents can do. And then we're going to hear from Maggie Saldine. Uh, actually, we're going to hear from the sheriff next, I think, uh, about what's happening in our community. And then Maggie Saldine's going to talk from Rocky Mountain Harm Reduction Center. Um, you're all going to be trained tonight on how to administer naloxone, which is an antidote to opioid overdoses and can save lives. And then we'll hear from Laura Land Landrum, who's here from Building Hope, to talk about resources here locally. So let's go ahead and get started, and I'll turn it over to Rob. Thanks very much, Amy. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, and uh, hopefully you can hear me. If not, then uh, throw something at me. A can of uh, water would work and hit me over the head. I'll start moving better. Uh, so um, again, my name is Rob Valak. I'm from a statewide organization called the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. We are a statewide task force to try to help to lab, um, develop collaborative responses to this opioid and fentanyl crisis. And I travel all over the state. I've been to all 64 counties in our state three times in the last eight years talking with folks and doing these kinds of events. And I can honestly say the first thing I want to say is that Amy and Jamie and Maggie are among the best people you will find doing this work anywhere, and I go across the country doing it, you know, and all of that. They're tremendous advocates, super knowledgeable, very dedicated, and you've really got some of the best people you could imagine here in the state that are they're doing the very best job that, you know, we're doing. Colorado is often held out as doing a pretty good job with this. It's kind of scary because it's still very impactful here, uh, but it's a lot worse in other parts of the country because of the efforts of people like this sitting at that table. So you're very fortunate to live in a community that have these uh, resources here. I'm just going to do a very uh, high-level flyover in like three minutes of sort of the state of the opioid crisis and, you know, why we're all here talking about this. Um, and by way of grounding, you know, we're talking about opioids, and you hear about opioids, it's the opioid crisis, it's the fentanyl crisis, but you hear about a lot of different terms in that. Opioids basically are, is a broad term for a class of drugs um, that include legal ones like hydrocodone or Vicodin, 
or oxycodone, which could be Percodan or Percocet or Oxycontin, or it could be fentanyl, which actually is a legal drug that was created in 1959, FDA approved in 1968 for people like my dad, an anesthesiologist, to use to manage your pain when you're in surgery. And it's a great drug if you're in surgery and your surgeon and your anesthesiologist are using it. It's not a great drug if it's not in that setting. Uh, it's much more dangerous and that's why we're here. But all of those are legal opioids. Then there's illegal ones, like heroin, which used to be legal, uh, was manufactured in 1898 by the good folks at Bayer, aspirin and all that, and heroin, invented both of them. Uh, but over the years, that was outlawed, and heroin now is all illegal, and it's produced illegally. So it's most, mostly black tar heroin that we get in Colorado, and white China heroin is mostly an East Coast phenomenon. So we see mostly black tar here. But heroin is an opioid and is very potent. Fentanyl is an opioid that's 50 times more potent than heroin. So it's just the, the same, it works the same way in your body. It interrupts pain signals and it can suppress your breathing and the things that it does to your body are the same. It just does it a whole lot stronger is where we are now. So it's like we saw this with opium in the, back in the day, you know, 2,000 years ago. Then we saw it with morphine and soldiers disease after the Civil War. Then we saw it with heroin in the 19 teens until we said we got to regulate that and get rid of heroin. Then we saw it again with, with heroin in the 70s, with oxy in the 90s, and now we're seeing another wave here with fentanyl. So you see these different waves of the crisis. We call this three waves of the crisis that we're seeing. And the first wave was really the prescription drugs from Oxycontin, and you hear about Purdue Pharma, Oxycontin, too much prescribing way too many tablets out there, people getting hooked on those sorts of things, and then maybe progressing to heroin, but most often starting with prescribed opioids. That was a phenomenon in the 90s and early 2000s. That is largely starting to go away. It's not gone, but it's going away. We've been working on it real hard. And then heroin sort of slid in behind it and said, all right, if we're cutting down on oxy, we can just sort of mix in heroin in there and take care of that. And the cartels thought that's a great opportunity to start pushing heroin into the supply in the United States again. So heroin made a big comeback in the late 90s and to first till about 2010. Now that has leveled off and now we are in the era of synthetics or fentanyl. And so fentanyl is a purely synthetic, very, very powerful opioid, the most powerful one you're going to encounter uh, in widespread um, cases. So that's where we are now in this jump in overdose deaths that you see on this graph. The, the blue one is from, from or the gray one, sorry, was common opioids, prescribed ones. Blue, you saw the little heroin uptick in the 90s. Now this giant explosion in the third wave is, is synthetics like fentanyl. And we've gotten to the point now where more than 564,000 people in the United States have died from an overdose in the last 20 years. Last year, it was over 100,000 people. And two-thirds, almost three-quarters of them had fentanyl involved. So we're talking over 70,000 fentanyl-involved overdose deaths in the United States last year. And the numbers are growing rapidly, not just, it used to be 5 or 8% a year growth. Now it's 10, 12, 18% per year growth. And understandably, people like Amy or whoever's in public health, it's freaking them out because that's a lot of growth of something that's a cause of death. This is so potent, and that's why we're here tonight. You know, why is fentanyl so dangerous? Like I said, it's super potent. It's 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine, 50 times stronger than heroin. It's the strongest thing you'll find. It's also a problem because sometimes it's legal. Fentanyl might be in a patch that somebody prescribes someone, or maybe it's illegal. It comes into all kinds of different forms. It might show up in some fake tablets that you might get, and that's very common now. If you don't know where it came from and you didn't get the tablets from a pharmacy, handed to you by the pharmacist themselves, of which I am one, if you don't get a drug that way, do not put it in your mouth because you don't know where it came from and there could well be fentanyl in it, as you will hear, there could well be fentanyl in it and the only safe drugs to take are things where you get them OTCs and you can peel the, peel the foil off of that thing for the Tylenol or a prescription you got from the pharmacy, anything else because the cartels now are pressing tablets to look like M30s or oxycodone or to look like Xanax or to look like other things that people might want to take, even a Stratera, a fake stimulant tablet, and put some fentanyl in it. Because it's cheap and it's easy to get the precursors to fentanyl from China, manufacture fentanyl in the last step in a lab, and put it into anything. And that's what people say, well, they're trying to fake me out at 
just put a little bit of fentanyl is the cheapest thing to do. So I don't have to get oxycodone for you. I don't have to grow poppies and make heroin. I can just do something real cheap. Order stuff from China, bake it in a lab, put it into fake tablets, and ship it into the United States. And that's what you get in these tablets. And it's really, really rather scary because you don't know what's in any one tablet. I say it's like a chocolate chip cookie. You could have a cookie with no chocolate chips in it if somebody's really crude in making them. Or you might have one cookie that has 20 chips in it. It says it's really crude, the people making the tablets. And that one with the 20 chips will kill you. And you don't know from looking at the tablet which one is the cookie with the 20 chips or which one is the cookie with no chips. So it's really, really scary. And that's why I always tell people, boy, if you didn't get it from a pharmacy, don't take it. I wouldn't. So it's really important. And so just the tiniest amount of fentanyl will kill you. And it's this, uh, even scarier, as I was talking with one of our panelists before, this is, isn't the strongest thing that's out there. There are things even stronger than fentanyl called nitazines. You've heard isonitazine. There's a whole class of drugs that are stronger than that. And there's sufentanil and carfentanil, these analogs of fentanyl that have been synthesized that are even stronger. So all of this, the stakes are just getting higher and higher for anything that, again, isn't from a legal supply that you need to, do, to be taking under prescription from a doctor and you got it from a pharmacy. It's like a Russian roulette game where the stake, the odds are just getting worse and worse and worse every few years. It's like adding another bullet to the chamber. And you wouldn't want to play Russian roulette with one bullet. But now do you want to play it with two or three now in the chamber? And the nitazines is like five out of six. If you have a nitazine present, it's almost a guaranteed thing. It's just not worth, that's what they say, the DEA's message. You know, one pill can kill. So that's why we're here tonight to talk about it. And you're going to hear from some, some uh, really good speakers. And I hope that, uh, that you'll, you'll engage with this and ask us a lot of questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I'm going to just have to toggle here out of this presentation um, before we watch this video, which is what we'll do next. fentanyl. A knife, we split it. It's odor. What is inside this vial could kill you almost instantly. In fact, this much would kill you a knife, we split it. It's odorless, tasteless, and it's currently being disguised as nearly any drug you can buy off the street. This is fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is a hundred times stronger than morphine and about 50 times the strength of heroin. Fentanyl has sedative effects and will rapidly slow down a person's breathing. Just a milligram too much of fentanyl can result in hypoxia, a decrease of oxygen to the brain, and can quickly lead to death. Sounds more like a poison than a drug. If you were to ingest fentanyl and live, your body would begin having withdrawals within a few hours. Fentanyl is one of the most addictive substances known to man. It is also rather cheap to produce considering its potency which is why it is being used in all types of illicit drugs. Pills, cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, even some instances of marijuana. Illegal drugs have been forever changed because of fentanyl. The most notable are the fake prescription pills. In 2021, the DEA alone seized over 20 million fake prescription pills made of fentanyl. These pills, designed to look exactly like prescription drugs such as oxycodone, Percocet, Xanax, Adderall, and more, contain nothing but fentanyl in a colored binder and are pressed to look just like the pills you would get from a pharmacy. The difference, though, is a matter of life or death. The DEA has reported over 42% of pills tested for fentanyl contain a potentially lethal dose. So maybe it's not the first pill someone takes, but one shortly after. Over the past few years, there has been enough fentanyl seized to kill every person in the United States. Fentanyl is being found everywhere in almost every drug, but you won't know it's there until it's too late. Your decision to not try a drug is one of the most important decisions that you can make. Over time, pop culture seems to glorify drugs more and more. 
Drugs have been promoted as solutions to mental health struggles like depression and anxiety. Trying drugs has been normalized as something that is just part of going through life. In reality, it is something that will take your life from you. With fentanyl's increasing prevalence in nearly all drugs today, promoting drug use is one of the most dangerous messages an influential person can communicate, especially to young people. The glamorous lifestyle associated with drug use is a facade. Many famous people suffer brutal addictions behind the scenes, and fentanyl is exposing that truth. More and more great artists, athletes, and talents are falling to fentanyl. With them are many others who fell for the lie that using illicit drugs can solve any pain or problem in your life. It is a lie you must be smart enough to see through. Fentanyl is a death trap that very few escape once they enter into it. Do not be deceived. <laughs> Fentanyl has turned drug dealers into death dealers. And today's easy access to drugs means that a dealer could be anybody. Most illicit drug sales today happen online and over social media. Many of the drug death stories I've encountered are of teens and young adults who bought a pill or a bit of cocaine and had it delivered to their family's house. A lot of times it was from somebody that they knew. Let's make this clear. It does not matter how well you think you know someone. It does not matter if they tell you the drug that they have is really what they say it is. You both do not know if fentanyl is in that drug until it is too late. Just because you've seen a friend try a drug, or even if you've tried something before, does not mean it's going to be safe. These drugs are not coming from a pharmacy or a lab with quality control. These drugs are being blended together by random people who do not care about you and bagged up for a quick profit. What seems like a safe dose could contain enough fentanyl to kill multiple people simply because of how carelessly these drugs are made. Again, you won't know until it's too late. Fentanyl is now the leading cause of death for young people in the United States. Some are looking for relief, some for a good time, many are just curious and make a stupid mistake. Had they known fentanyl was in the drugs they took, they never would have done it. But they can't take that choice back now. You, though, have a choice to make for your life. You may struggle sometimes and feel like you need help. You may get curious or tempted to try a drug. Remember that feelings are temporary, but some decisions can last forever. You always have the opportunity to choose something greater, something that will give you life and not death. I encourage you today to realize how precious your life is and that one choice is all it takes to throw it away. Please do not do it. Remember that you have a purpose. You have gifts and passions that are unique to you. You are made to have a future. You can live an amazing life without ever touching a drug. Just keep going after the things you know are right, things that are good for you. You'll be an example for your friends and you can encourage them too. If you're a young person and learned something from this video today, I want you to share it with your friends because this information is saving lives right now. You could be the friend that saves someone's life by keeping them from making a big mistake. Please share it. If you're a parent or guardian and you wanna learn more about how you can educate and protect your children from fentanyl poisoning, then I need you to head over to naturalhigh.org slash fentanyl right now and sign up with your email to receive the free fentanyl toolkit. Natural High will keep you updated with information and resources you can share with your children. My name is Dominic Tierno. My natural highs are faith and filmmaking. Thank you for watching. So that's a very powerful, powerful video. Um, and I definitely encourage you, there is a 20 minute version, Dead on Arrival, that um, is also extremely powerful. I encourage you, if you're a parent, to watch it with your youth. Uh, if you are in the lives of young adults, uh, encourage them to watch it um, because it's, it's powerful and will save lives, for sure. Um, we're going to move on now to um, hear about, let's see, there we go. There we go. AJ, AJ and Stevie's story from Matt Riviere. So um, please welcome Matt. He drove all the way from Monument this evening to come talk to you. Um, so let's give him your attention. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Riviere, and, and these are my two sons. Uh, this is Stephen on the left. He was 19 when he passed away. Andrew, my oldest son, was 21. 
Uh, in July of last year, both my boys uh, died side by side in their bed in their apartment. Uh, they were, took what they thought was oxycodone, don't know where they got it. It's their first time, from what I understand of them trying, uh, their roommates said it was the first time they had tried that drug. And now, now I'm childless and my, my boys are gone forever. And like that video was very sobering, uh, it really is one pill can kill. And now I'm trying to be an advocate to, to really help parents and young people really think twice about these decisions. You know, my boys were, they were good, they were good hearted kids. And I, I don't look at my kids and uh, posthumously and say, gosh, they were so amazing. They were so awesome. They were all this. Uh, they were really good hearted kids, but they were struggling and they were stumbling through life. They, they struggled with mental illness. Uh, Andrew, who we called AJ, uh, was bipolar. And he was really wrestling with choices. His, uh, my, my wife, after 26 years, left me overnight and uh, it really tore the stable family apart. It came out of nowhere. We were all reeling. Uh, she was bipolar as well. And so it really left us, uh, I think, just struggling. So the, the boys were, I think, medicating. It made their issues worse. How does this family who's involved in youth ministry, uh, doing sports and Cub Scouts and wrestling, what happened? And I, I can only imagine what was going through their heads, but I know that they were medicating. My boys' journey started, like some of you, doing vape. That was, the, that was their first entry into something was vape. And we had hard rules in the house. We do not vape in this house. That was just, that is not acceptable. But it went from that to flavored vape to nicotine. And then it turned to pot, right? Vaping pot. And that was an absolute no way. But they, for my boys, they just progressed. It's not everybody's story, but that was their story. And then it got into dabbing, which I was very open with my kids. I talked to them, Stevie, my youngest, we'd have one-on-one -on -one times at the time that he passed away. And he'd tell me what was going on. I'm like, man, this is my biggest concern for you, son, is one day you're gonna wind up in drug rehab. That was my concern. Steven was a 4.2 plus GPA student graduated high school with an AA degree. He was not a slacker. He streamed on YouTube, had a couple channels. He's 25 and 0 as a, a wrestler in middle school in his eighth grade year, was trained by people around the Olympics. He gave that up going into high school. Andrew was incredible with his hands. He could make all sorts of things. I'd bring him into work, I'd bring him to the machine shop and have him work with our machine manager. And, he was just blown away by how talented my oldest son was with his hands. It, not a gift that I had, not a gift that I had, but you know, I look at these faces. This was taken on our property at Christmas a few years ago. Full of life, full of purpose, full of vision, what they wanted to do, but they're still trying to figure it out. COVID certainly didn't help. They, my youngest took a gap year from school because he didn't want to be online. He just wanted, so he just started working and they worked together in the city of Monument. It's so important parents, and I can't stress this enough, and I don't know what's gonna be said following me, but you have got to have courageous conversations with your kids. And it is super uncomfortable, and it's super awkward, but you've gotta have them. Because a few minutes of awkwardness is gonna be better than a lifetime of regret. And if it's not your child that turns out like my kids, I, it's, the reality is, and you, you heard the statistics from Dr. Rob, it's going to be somebody you know. It's that bad. You saw that hockey stick statistic. It just ju is jumping up. And here in Colorado, it's, it's awful how bad we're seeing things doubling each year. And so I really want to encourage you. I can't stress it more. You've got to have these conversations. You've got to educate yourself on what was being shared. Not that you bombard your kids with all these statistics, but you need to understand the crisis that we're in. You've got to be the smartest person in the room because let me tell you, your kids are brilliant. I mean, my son would always say, Dad, you got to see this on YouTube. And I'm, I'm like, let me grab my glasses. He's always shoving his phone in my face. They know a lot. They're incredibly techy. They know more than you, really. But in this case, you've got to know more than them. You've got to get educated. I knew nothing about fentanyl. 
At 2 a.m., my wife banged on my door to tell me my kids were dead. That's when I found out what fentanyl was. When the coroner called me and said, do you know what fentanyl is? I thought, oh, that's not what killed uh, Michael Jackson. They're like, no, that is something else. Fentanyl is what killed Prince. Fentanyl is what killed Toby Mac's son last year. I knew nothing of it. Now I'm, I'm learning. Even tonight talking to Dr. Rob and just, wow, there's so much to learn. But you've got to be educated. You've got to sit down with your kids and not talk at them. But what I like to do with the boys, I think boys do better side by side, have those, you know, we'd drive in the car, we'd get in the jacuzzi. That's when they wanted to talk. And they'd tell me all sorts of things that probably I didn't want to know, but they told me. But you've got to have, you've got to have those times. And I, I think about my boys. They, if we could bring them back tonight, the very first thing they'd say, and I know this because it goes through my head, when I see their urns at the house, when I, I have this picture, I right by a salt lamp, every day I turn it on and it lights up that picture. And I, I literally am still shaking my head, literally, that these boys are gone. They'd say, Dad, that was really stupid. We should have known better. They didn't know they were taking fentanyl. But they got caught in this terrible trap that you heard about from Dr. Rob and from this video. I, I speak out, it's, it's certainly painful. You know, tomorrow will be rough because it's usually the next day that I really feel the effects of coming up and, and processing, sharing my boy's story with folks like you. But we want, we want to save lives. That's what this is all about. And I appreciate you guys coming tonight. And you high school students, I know I was in your seat one time. For us, it was pot and alcohol. The odds are really high. You, you woke up from that stuff if you didn't go out and do something stupid like drunk driving, even though I, I did stupid stuff like that. You don't wake up from this stuff. This is, this is going to kill you. And that, that is not just a scare tactic. It really is reality. You, you are not invincible, although you might feel that you're invincible, you're not. My boys felt they were invincible. And they're not. And now I don't have my sons anymore. You know, you think about, you saw that bottle that was shown in the video. You just to understand, I carry a sugar packet with me in my bag. And the reason I carry this is because this is a good visual aid. If this was pure fentanyl, all of you would be dead in this room, plus about another 1,425 people. This would enough to kill 1,500 people. That is how potent fentanyl is. Two months ago in Colorado, we had a bus of 114 pounds of pure fentanyl on our interstate. That will kill 25 million Americans. That's what's happening. And it's not just overdose, we absolutely have an overdose crisis, but what, like in my boy's case, it was poisoning. They thought they were gonna have Oxy and have a great time. They ordered DoorDash at four in the morning. They thought they were gonna get high, have a great time, and they were going to work the next day at Popeye's Chicken. And they never woke up. My youngest, the coroner explained that he laid in his bed with his arm under his head and that's exactly when, I, when they were at home, I'd go in their room and I'd kiss them at night, even as older teens, when they were asleep, and I'd whisper in their ear, Daddy loves you. And that's exactly how my son would lay. That's the last image I have of my son. Thank goodness I didn't find him. But I ho hope tonight that you really are sobered by this. This is, this is a crisis. And it really can happen to you. It is not the drug addicts when I was a kid growing up that it was the guy shooting up in a dark alley. And we we're getting this on Snapchat. They're coming to your bedroom window. They're dropping off the drugs. It's, it's like that. It's like DoorDash for drugs. That's how easy these are. And you cannot trust, like Dr. Rob says, anybody. 97% of street drugs, they say, the DEA says are going to contain fentanyl. That's just the reality of, of the world that you kids are living in. It is not safe. We're finding fentanyl laced 
in marijuana now. That is incredibly scary in an open state as well. So I hope that will resonate with you. I think that, you, you know, with the goal of tonight is you see these statistics and they're shocking, but we want to put a face with those statistics. And my boy's story is, is not unique. It was two boys in a night, but we have seen story upon story here in Colorado. I'll tell you one more or two more. Uh, we had a family um, of, of sisters. They weren't drug addicts. They decided they were going to go on a Friday, Saturday night and do some lines of coke. Five people died in one apartment here in Commerce City doing cocaine. Cocaine, when I was in high school, it didn't kill you. We lost five and uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, they, they left their three-month-old daughter to be raised without their parents. Uh, we had another family in Colorado. Uh, the boyfriend and the girlfriend took one pill. They split it in half. She died. He lived. And the next day, he was so filled with grief and remorse that he killed himself. And it's not just the lives that, that, that are gone. It's the downstream and the upstream effects. The parents like me that I have to live the rest of my life without my kids. I have to look at their urns. I have to deal with that loss the rest of my life. You don't get through it. You kind of got to grow through it. But that's the upstream effects of their mom and I. We have to deal with that. Their friends who've never been around drugs, who hopefully will take them through, the, through Colorado to speak to the high schools. They don't have their best friends, and that was never part of their life. You don't want that to be you. You don't want it to be your sons and daughters, certainly, but you don't want it to be your friends. So if you take anything from tonight, I hope you really hear this with seriousness, that we're losing a lot of people. When fentanyl becomes the number one killer in America for adults 18 to 45, and we're talking about gun violence and COVID all over the news, but fentanyl is killing more people than those two things, we've got to wake up. Tomorrow in Congress, in DC, I've been working with the local congressman. We have another congressman, Agus, up here that's just co-signed the bill, co-sponsored the bill. We're going to ask the federal government to release funds uh, to K through 12 from COVID funds to be able to help bring naloxone into the schools and do what we can do. So we're really working hard on the state, local, and federal level to do what we can do. Why do I do this? Because I don't want you guys, parents, to go through what I've gone, gone through. And kids, I don't want you to make the same stupid choices my kids made. It was dumb, and they know it. And that's why, why I do this. I hope that we can save lives together. Thank you uh, for letting me share my heart and my story with you. If you want to find out more about this story, um, you guys do YouTube, right? Something like that? Yeah, yeah you've done that? Okay, on YouTube, you can just Google poisoned America's fentanyl crisis. My boy's story is episode three. The entire documentary is on Hulu with the same title. It explains the fentanyl crisis, but um, you'll hear it here in the third episode is about Colorado specifically and my boy's story. And I think just to, to hear that, have that face, is, it's been very helpful for the, the high school students that we've shown it to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, so, so much for sharing AJ and Stevie's story with us here tonight. It's really important that we understand when we look at more statistics uh, that with every overdose statistic, there are friends, family members, and neighbors who are grieving a loss, and we can't forget that. So thank you so much for sharing this evening. I have no doubt that it will save lives so that others don't have to share pain that you have right now. Thank you for that. So I know that Rob talked a lot about um, color, or the national data, but we're going to look a little bit at the Colorado data right now, and Matt spoke to this too. Um, and so in 2022, we had about just over 14, 1,400 uh, overdose deaths, um, and that jumped to over 1,800 uh, in 2021. This data was just finalized uh, over the last several weeks. but you can see the stark increase in just two years of those overdoses that involved fentanyl. 
It's alarming. This is just another way to look at that yellow line and bar graph uh, shows there were 10 times as many overdoses involving fentanyl in 2020 as in 2016. When we look at other drugs that cause overdoses, they've, they've increased and decreased over the years, but overall they've maintained uh, at a certain level, but not fentanyl. Those involving just fentanyl have increased. It's that hockey stick that we saw with the national data. Um, and those uh, that involve fentanyl and another drug, those are the top two killers right now as far as drug overdoses go in our state. Matt touched on this too, that the number one killer for people ages 18 to 85 um, is fentanyl. That's more than car accidents, suicides, COVID, and cancer. And when, when we look at overdoses by age group, um, it's even more concerning. Um, we have at the top that age group, 25 to 44, those young adults. Um, but what's also extremely concerning is that we have seen um, between 2019 and 2021, 600% increase of fentanyl overdoses in ages 10 to 18. 600% in two years. The game has changed. The cost of these drugs has never been cheaper and the potency has never been higher. This is, this is uh, some visuals of what we're talking about. So the lethal dose of fentanyl here compared to the tip of a pencil and lower here compared to a penny, it's the equivalent of 10 to 15 grains of salt is a deadly dose. So you can see why it's very easy to put in any pills. Uh, it's just mixed in buckets and barrels in people's basements. You don't need a growing season for opium. You don't need a growing season uh, like heroin. It's easy to produce year round. It's cheap. Um, a textbook size of fentanyl is about three to five million dollars worth. So it's easy to mail to people. They don't have to cart it around in big, big, uh, big amounts like heroin was. So it's very easy to send in the mail. In the upper right, uh, upper left corner here, uh, this image I love because it ta on the top is the green, um, green representation represents what the real pill looks like. The red is the fake pill. Can you tell them apart? So the first one on the left is uh, the Oxycontin, Oxycontin um, and the fake pills down below. This is the one we hear uh, or we're hearing a lot about early on uh, during this wave, but now we're starting to hear more about it being in Xanax and Adderall. So Xanax and Adderall um, are used pretty frequently among youth uh, for ADHD, for uh, anxiety, treating anxiety. Um, and we're seeing a lot and hearing a lot of stories in high schools across the nation, even here in our state, and at colleges of uh, people who are sharing their medications or they're looking for these medications because they might have some anxiety, they, uh, maybe about uh, from uh, an exam coming up that they think this might help them concentrate, perform better on a test. Um, the Globe family from Steamboat uh, lost their daughter um, to a Xanax pill. She had been dropped off at CU Boulder, uh, was pretty anxious about uh, the start of her senior year. Um, she thought that and heard that Xanax might help her anxiety so that she can kind of focus and get into school. Straight A student involved in skiing, um, graduated with honors from Steamboat High. She decided to go ahead and try Xanax. She bought a pill from her neighbor who was also another CU student. She didn't wake up the next day. That pill cost $5. It's accessible, it's cheap. Um, 
So it's really important to only take pills that are prescribed to you from a healthcare provider and given to you from a legitimate pharmacy. One of the um, new things that drug cartels are doing, an emerging trend, is that they're putting it into colors. Uh, so it looks like candy to entice young adults and youth to try it, get addicted, keep coming back for more. It's called rainbow fentanyl. It's not unlike what we saw with vaping uh, and, the, and the flavors that they're putting in vaping to get young people hooked. So fentanyl in your youth, uh, Matt touched on this, and, and Rob too, you know, it's not that people are getting drugs from the street. Um, there are some that are happening, but more and more we're seeing it, that people are able to order this online. Um, Snapchat is one of the most used because of its anonymity and um, the immediate uh, loss of data. It doesn't allow third party monitoring. And what kids can do is just put in a certain number uh, or a certain pattern of an emoji and that means they're ordering something. So if your kid has social media and is on social media, you need to talk to them about this. Um, they're seeing it. They, they understand that this teen drug culture exists. Kids aren't intentionally looking for fentanyl. They're getting it unknowingly and they're dying. So what can parents do? Matt touched on this uh, a lot. There are toolkits, um, lots of resources available. Uh, we will have three um, QR codes that, that will help give you some resources, but talking to your youth is critical. This is not a one and done, the drug talk, like the sex talk. It's, it's something that has to happen over time at lots of different ages, you need to start young. You need to understand your influence as a parent um, and learn as much as you can. So it's great that you're here tonight and please share with your friends, your family members, aunts, uncles, grandparents, um, and choose a good time and place. I'm a parent of two adolescents and I know they're rarely ready to talk when I wanna talk. So it's really important to identify those open door and window opportunities to just keep talking about these things. Using open-ended questions are critical. You know, have you heard about fentanyl? How did you hear about it? Where did you hear about it? What do you think about that? You can also ask them more direct questions. Are you seeing pills at school? Have you been offered a pill? If you haven't, what would you say if you were? What if you saw a friend taking a pill? Just to be able to gauge their knowledge and understanding so that you can help empower them with these difficult conversations and scenarios that they might be exposed to. Establishing eye contact is extremely important. Use active listening without judgment. Uh, talking about their future plans. Understanding that one decision could blow that out of the water. Offer empathy and support, be honest and have an open dialogue. We talked about that. Make sure they know the legal consequences of using drugs. Learn about and carry naloxone, which you're gonna do here tonight. And it's really important to make sure that, they that you're encouraging them to have a healthy relationship with their healthcare provider and to seek out help from behavioral health resources if they're feeling like they have anxiety, depression, uh, having a hard time with friends at school. Make sure that you're letting them know about the resources that are available. So this is a QR code, the first of three, that um, will take you to a lot of resources. We are seeing this happening at schools across the state. Um, last spring there was uh, a girl at high school in, in El Paso County that died at her desk. Um, this quote is from the communication officer from that, from that school district. You may be thinking to yourself, my child isn't caught up in the drug culture, or my child wouldn't even know where to get something like that. Does your child have a cell phone? Is your child on social media? 
is the answer? If the answer is yes, they likely do know about the teen drug culture and do have easy access. Much like the vaping epidemic that we experienced in 2018 and 2019, parents are often the last to know. Don't be the last to know. Be the first to have that conversation. And with that, I'm going to bring up the Sheriff, Sheriff Fitz Simons to talk about what we're seeing here in our community. Thanks. No, I don't need that. Maggie. Maggie, Maggie. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Jamie Fitzsimons, and I am your sheriff. Um, you know, I sit here and I listen to Matt. Uh, you know, Matt and I met down at uh, this last legislative session down at the Capitol in Denver working on this fentanyl bill. And Matt and these families that he talked about, I get emotional talking about it. All, you know, all testified at this bill. And, you know, and I started thinking that, you know, you, I hope you don't need me as the legal authority, as the sheriff, to stand here and tell you that everything that was presented here so far is true. You know, you only need to listen to, even if you don't listen to Rob, if you just listen to Matt, um, and it doesn't move you or touch you or make you think, uh, there's nothing I'm going to do to convince you. Because I don't have that story. I have lots of store. I have lots of mats, and so does Wendy, our deputy coroner. So do all these firefighters sitting here, the deputies in the back, because we've gone to Matt's house and these other families uh, here in our community. Um, so th thanks again, Matt, for for coming and sharing your story with everybody. Um, you know the, the fentanyl bill that just passed. You know there's there's. Um, there's a lot of things I disagree with it. There's a lot of good parts of it, that, uh, which is the harm reduction piece that Maggie's going to get up and talk about, which you should really listen to. Um, I, I'm a big believer in it. I, I would tell you that uh, that video is also really powerful. And, and you know, I, I've, been, I've been doing this job for so long now that everything that was talked about, you know, when I came on the job, it was PCP, uh, crack, and then it went to heroin, and then we came through the, you know, the, the, the graph that Rob showed of the opioid epidemic, and then the heroin again. Um, and then when we started seeing fentanyl here in Summit County, we started seeing it that people were extracting, they were obtaining, stealing, getting out of the trash cans, fentanyl patches from cancer patients. And they were squeezing the gel out of the patches and they were extracting the gel and the fentanyl and shooting up or smoking the fentanyl out of those. Um, that, that's how desperate people were getting with it. I, I will tell you that, you know, on a monthly basis, I receive narcotics intelligence from our state partners about what's going on here locally with interdictions. And I receive uh, a whole other set of data from our federal partners at the Mexican border and if you saw the amount of fentanyl that is being seized on the border, and the reason I say seized is because that's all we know about is what we're seizing. You can only imagine what's getting through the border. And when I say that is because then when I get the intelligence that comes up through the state and the interdictions they're doing on the interstate and the highways. Sorry, this keeps changing in front of me, and I think I'm changing it there, but it's not. Um, you know, it, it's a frightening amount of stuff. And it is all of these, fra you know, fraudulent pills, illicit pills. Uh, but what's even more frightening is, you know, you got to imagine that the cartel's in this for the money and the marketing. And that's why we're, Amy showed that slide of it looking like candy, like Skittles. You know, the way it's evolving ever so more is, as Matt showed you that sugar packet, as so Amy showed you the slide with how little fentanyl it takes to kill you. Um, you know, they're starting to ship now f pure fentanyl across the border because it is more compact, more valuable, and it's easier to import. It's less bulky, right? Instead of having to make all these pills down south of the border and try to get them up through different uh, methods, they're just sending the, fe the pure fentanyl up and they're setting up print, uh, you know, pill print operations up here where they're pressing those pills uh, here. 
and distributing it. So I mean, I mean, it's it's everywhere. You know, through the uh, opioid epidemic on the graph that Rob showed, you know, here in Summit County, Amy and I partnered a long time ago with a task force up here where we started the medication uh, drop boxes to try to get people to get the opioids out of the house. You know, we were doing a drug take back in the back there. Um, when naloxone came along, you know, all law enforcement and all EMS in Summit County carried naloxone. Um, I, you know, this fentanyl bill is gonna allow for other harm reduction measures that I'm sure Maggie will touch on, but you know, I was a huge driver of those harm reduction measures. You know, and I would tell you that a lot of people in law enforcement have their foot in one side of the line or the other, right? It's either enforcement, interdiction, or it's harm reduction. I would tell you, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in both. I, I believe that we have to have these harm reduction measures. We've gotta be able to help people uh, to stop dying and help people that do wanna get sober or do wanna stop uh, doing this. You know, I'm a big believer that, that we need to apply the, the same principles and the same commitment to substance use that we did with mental health. Look what we've done with mental health in this community. It's amazing what we've done as a community. There's no reason why we can't do this with substance use and, and harm reduction. You know, when I talk about the interdiction piece too, you know, and, and that I'm a big believer in that because as the sheriff, right, I, I can't stand by and watch this amount of dope come through the county. So what I monitor up until now is the dope that is seized on all four entry points of the county. Just, just outside the county borders, because we don't know about the inside because nobody's working it. So before the end of the year here, we're gonna implement it to the sheriff's office, we're gonna bring back in an interdiction narcotics dog. And we're gonna start doing interdiction here inside the county and try to intercept some of this phenomenal amount of dope that's polluting our county. Right, so that's the enforcement interdiction side. But again, I, I still wear the hat of big believer in harm reduction. We've got to approach it from both sides. But I'm telling you that if you need to hear from me, this is no joke. What Rob has said, what Matt has said, what Amy has said, what Maggie's going to share with you, it's no joke. People are dying. You know, Wendy Kipple's here, our deputy coroner. Uh, she can tell you how many, how many overdose deaths we respond to. We're all committed to doing this. We're all, you know, I, I give away Narcan. I have been giving away Narcan at the Sheriff's Office ever since we've uh, we started deploying it around public safety. But I mean, we'll give it to anybody. We give it to every inmate that leaves the jail. You know, when we talk about harm reduction and working on substance use, we do uh, it in the jail as well. We offer a medication assisted treatment program. We offer uh, EMDR, eye movement. Any? I love that. Say it a little louder. For, for trauma and substance use. And now we're also doing Accu Detox, where they're trying to now rebrand as Accu Wellness because they're finding that it's uh, applicable to so many uh, to so many issues. So I'm trying on all ends, and I'm asking you to join all of us and you, you guys in school. It's no joke. Any of these pills, it, it really is, as Rob said, playing Russian roulette. It really, really is. And I hope you listen to Maggie because she just might save your life, what she's about to talk about. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, now we're going to bring up Maggie Saldine from the Rocky Mountain Harm Reduction Center to teach you about how to use naloxone, which, by the way, all of our schools in our school district have this medication. The nurses and pairs have been trained, and we're going to be training staff as well. Um, so that's exciting. And just for local data, last year, um, I forgot to mention that five out of six overdoses that occurred last year in Summit County were fentanyl-related. So it is here, we are seeing these deaths as well. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you all so much for being here. And um, just to follow up, you saw the data that there were over 900 fentanyl specific overdoses in Colorado last year, which was half of the 1800 overdoses in the state of Colorado. So definitely a terrifying issue getting exponentially worse every year. So hello, my name is Maggie Seldine and I am the founder and director of High Rockies Harm Reduction. And I grew up in Carbondale, Colorado. I'm a person in active and sustained recovery and I lost my mother to a heroin overdose when I was 15 years old. So it is a huge honor and privilege to be here with y'all today. I have continued to lose countless friends to overdoses from opioids, from stimulants, to people who try to quit drinking alcohol cold turkey and die. There are a lot of drug-related deaths out there in our communities and a lot of work that we can do, but I'm here to talk to you about one of the greatest tools and resources that we have at our disposal. Um, I am what they call the naloxone expert for rural Colorado communities, but I learned everything I know from Dr. Rob Ballack, so it's a BFD to have him here, and I'm really honored, and, and truly folks like Matt are the real experts, and often our kids are the real experts. I presented to a group of seventh graders who had more questions than college classes I presented to um, last week in Eagle County. So our kids are very aware of these issues. And um, interestingly enough, I also like knew nothing about drug safety or drugs when I was a drug user. So it's kind of like a weird lopsided thing where we think we know it all, but we really know very, very little. So um, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of propaganda and just a lot of mixed information out there about fentanyl and overdose risks. So I wanna say first and foremost, the bottom line is fentanyl is just one of many, many opioid issues we're experiencing right this moment as a huge epidemic. But there are a lot of opioids out there that can, will, and have killed people. And naloxone will reverse any opioid overdose. So bottom line, it may not be fentanyl. I don't know what's in this pill. I don't know what's in my drugs. If it is an opioid, naloxone will reverse that opioid overdose. So a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. I also wanna put it out there that I have my brochures and cards on the back table and am available after this presentation because this is a lot of information. If you go to highrockiesharmreduction.com, we have short videos on how to use Narcan, how to use fentanyl test strips, and I host an hour long training online every first Friday. So again, there's opportunities to learn more because I'm about to say a lot. <clears throat> So we're gonna talk about how to recognize and respond to an opioid overdose once it happens. Like Dr. Rob said, um, opioids are pretty much our pain-killing class of drugs. Not all painkillers are opioids necessarily, but all opioids are used to kill pain in a medical setting, heroin being our only real, truly only illegal opioid at this point in time and was used in medical um, settings previously. But so there's a couple reasons I want to talk about why people use opioids. Of course, people use them for pain management. True legal painkillers that you get from your doctor can still be lethal in large amounts. But people who have legitimate pain often are closed off to the legal ways of getting them. And so we across the board see people with very legitimate pain needs accessing illegal opioids on the street. And this is a huge concern. I get calls all the time for people who are trying to manage real pain and are terrified because they know the Percocets they're buying on the street now are fentanyl. There are a variety of effects that opioids cause. In addition to the pain killing, they're known for causing kind of a euphoric high, just a sense of well-being. And so for this reason, people who have psychiatric illnesses or a family history of psychiatric illness are very susceptible to opioid addiction. The physical human body will develop a physical dependence to these drugs within about five to 14 days of using them as a doctor prescribes. Now, when we become physically dependent, that means that when we stop using the drug, 
we're going to start getting sick. And so it's a vicious cycle of most of the time people start with a legal prescription. All too often people start with somebody else's old or unused prescription, which is why we strongly encourage you to bring your unused prescriptions to events like this or really any sheriff's department anytime to safely dispose of those medications. But so people start using these drugs often for a surgery or some injury, especially in our outdoor adventure communities, and then they develop dependence. They start getting sick when they stop taking it, and so they are now on the hunt to find it because once their doctor finds out that they're addicted, if their doctor is on the level, they're probably not gonna be able to get these medications anymore. Again, it's a vicious cycle, and this is how, how and why we see people traditionally seeking drugs on the street. Additionally, tolerance to the different effects of opioids builds up kind of lopsided. So people will pretty quickly develop a tolerance to the pain killing and to the euphoric effects and need to use more and more. Often they're not even getting high or treating pain anymore. They're just not getting sick anymore. They're just kind of getting normal, which happens with a lot of drug tolerance. You build up a tolerance to the actual like high that you get from it. You're just using so that you don't get sick and it's just a vicious cycle and we see now, even people on the streets, even before the, the drastic change in drug trends where now really all you could get is fentanyl, like you can't really find heroin on the streets anymore because of many of the reasons that Amy and Dr. Rob talked about today. But even before that, we saw people kind of moving towards those fentanyl patches and, and seeking just stronger and stronger opioids to meet that addiction. Now, before I go to this, because I've got some new slides, so this is an awesome slide, but I just wanted to say that the tolerance to the lethal effects of opioids, such as respiratory depression that I'll talk about in slides to come, may never go away, um, or you may never really fully build up a tolerance to that, that respiratory depression, which is what will ultimately kill you. So you're using more and more to try to get high, to try to stay well, but you're putting yourself at increased risk for overdose. Now, part of why it is so super, super important that we carry naloxone everywhere and have it rapidly accessible is because there is a very short window of time that somebody can survive an opioid overdose or any medical event with uh, you know no oxygen getting to their brain. And so we want to respond and get oxygen going back to the brain with the naloxone as soon as possible. As you can see, um, within 30 minutes to 90 minutes with a standard heroin opioid overdose, you're going to go from that respiratory depression, meaning you've stopped breathing, all the way to cardiac arrest where you your heart has stopped and all organ function has ceased. With fentanyl, we have a lot less time to get oxygen back to the brain. It literally does kill faster. Fentanyl crosses the blood-brain barrier faster, and we have literal minutes to respond in the event of an overdose and restore oxygen. So I'm going to try really hard to start saying naloxone instead of Narcan because now we have a variety of nasal sprays which are available for free tonight as well. We have our standard Narcan nasal spray which we saw developed around 2015-2016 and just mass produced and put out there since then because it is so easy for the general public to use. Um, at my company High Rockies Harm Reduction and other harm reduction programs in Denver and Grand Junction, we do still carry the traditional intramuscular formula of naloxone, which was actually developed in the 1960s. And now, because specifically of the strength of fentanyl and the speed at which fentanyl kills, they have developed an eight milligram um, naloxone nasal spray, so twice as strong as the traditional Narcan, and it can work a little faster and last a little longer in response to fentanyl. Um, this is still pretty new, so I haven't seen a lot of anecdotal evidence, but you know, this is really if we're worried about fentanyl, so if it's somebody who's concerned about contamination in cocaine or pills, we'd like you to carry Cloxado. Naloxone is the generic name for this drug developed in the 1960s. Everything else, Narcan, Cloxado, is all brand names. So we, myself, and the folks at the consortium are trying to stick to naloxone to normalize that because everyone's gotten really used to Narcan, but now we have some other cool nasal sprays too. So what happens in an opioid overdose? So our brains, okay, a couple things I wanna, I almost forgot that um, as a person in recovery, 
And listening to Matt sharing his story, I really wanted to make sure I remember to say my belief as someone who works with people in active addiction is that the majority of substance misuse is because of undiagnosed and untreated mental illness. And so if we could diagnose bipolarity or ADHD or autism early on, before kids start having problems in school, when we start seeing these red flags, I was first suspended for violence in kindergarten. I was expelled from high school my freshman year. These are all red flags <laughs> that, that could have been seen pretty early on, right? And so again, like these are mental health issues and we've come so far as a nation and as a community in, in terms of mental health, we have to start seeing substance misuse as a mental health issue because our kids experiment more and more today because we can't cope with the reality of this really terrifying messed up world. That is the truth, right? But there are better ways and safer ways to get high and we should be talking about that and we should also be talking about what drugs are actually supposed to do to you because if we know that cocaine isn't supposed to make us feel super itchy, then we can know that that's contaminated with an opioid. We can know that we got the wrong thing. So there's a lot we can do in terms of just education and prevention but my point is Whenever we take a drug, we are mimicking a natural chemical reaction to like an extreme form that our body would never naturally produce. Um, exercising is a way better way to get the, pretty much the same high that drugs gives us in a healthy, manageable way that we can still keep feeling that way over and over again. Um, when I was a kid, we talked about drugs are like taking ice cream scoops out of your brain because what we do is we flood our brains with an unnatural amount of these feel-good chemicals and then our brain can't make those chemicals anymore for a while or sometimes for years or potentially ever. So the brain has receptors to naturally capture opioids, to naturally capture cannabinoids, to naturally capture serotonin and dopamine released by molly or ecstasy. So what's happening in an opioid overdose is those chemicals that naturally exist to capture opioids are all full and there's still more opioid floating around in the system, meaning we've put way more than ever, that our body could ever possibly conceive to create of this drug into our system. And what opioids do, they're a fascinating drug because they are, in our country, scheduled as one of the most dangerous, addictive, terrible, most insidious drugs um, sometimes, but they actually do no damage long term to the organs of our body the way that drugs like alcohol or stimulants like methamphetamine do. They really just destroy our brains and how our brains work um, and mess up our rational decisioning and they slow everything else down. So people who um, commonly abuse opioids generally have no interest in sex, they have a decreased libido, they generally are constipated and have a hard time going to the bathroom. And so when you have an opioid overdose, it's like everything's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down until it stops. So when all of those receptors to capture opioids are full and there's still opioids in the brain, everything slows down until our breathing stops and we have respiratory depression, which will ultimately lead to everything else shutting down cardiac arrest and death. Now, what naloxone does is it is an opioid antagonist. These brain receptors have a higher affinity for this drug. It's able to come in, kick out, excuse me, those opioids and bind and block the opioid receptors for a limited time. So it literally reverses the opioid overdose. It kicks the drug out of the brain receptors and blocks those receptors. So some factors that increase your risk of overdose, any period of sobriety for somebody who is a regular or known opioid user, particularly people leaving the jail setting are about 128 times, and that's old data, <laughs> more likely to overdose in the two weeks leaving jail than the general public. That includes somebody leaving rehab or somebody who just, um, you know, chooses to be sober for whatever reason and then they relapse. They tend to use the same amount that they could before and they're 
tolerance, again, is a wonky thing. Tolerance both goes up and down pretty quickly with a lot of drugs. So people lose that tolerance, they use the same amount and they overdose. That's what happened to my mom. She went to rehab to avoid getting prosecuted for being a drug dealer. And when she used for the first time after rehab, she overdosed and died. So again, um, as much as we can do preventative education, compassionate care, we've seen that the punitive methods just really aren't working for our people. Um, obviously, injection drug use, and whenever we're putting something directly into our vein, it is going to get into our system, and it's harder to get out, especially if we were to eat a pill. You could, in theory, pump a stomach, but with fentanyl, that kind of like does not <laughs> help us at all. Um, but regardless, we like to try to move people away from IV drug use as much as possible because even smoking a drug can potentially reduce the risk of overdose. So right next to each other, using different strains and purchasing from the black market, these are kind of like one in the same reason and what we've been talking about a lot tonight. The illicit drug supply is always messed up. You are never getting what you think you're getting and you may be getting something that is lethally contaminated. And that includes things we buy online. I had somebody bring some pills recently that were ordered from a company online in a blister pack, looked totally legit, tested positive for fentanyl. I am still not 100% sure if that's even true because the fentanyl test strips, there's some false positives, there's some issues, but the bottom line, that pill, I could smell how strong it was. The person said a quarter of it was stronger than any oxy that they'd ever taken. They bought this online from a reputable source. I have investigated this. They have investigated this. I've actually had the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Traffic Enforcement air people investigate this. It is totally not a legit company. It says on the package you can't have it without a prescription and somebody bought it online. So whether it's Instagram, Amazon, Snapchat, if you bought a blender from China online, how likely is it gonna work or be the exact blender that you saw in the picture, right? Like it is not safe just because it's coming online. I talked a little bit about, um, you know, any history of psychiatric issues can present risks for overdose and just risk for addiction. The same with any um, physical health conditions. Anytime we have any health history, it can complicate issues. And having those psychiatric illnesses just really increases our risk for addiction with opioids. And really, most overdoses do have multiple drugs in, in, in the system. And again, these can be legal drugs or drugs bought off the street. But specifically, and this is really important for our young people, um, Opioids, benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax and alcohol are all central nervous system depressants. So anytime we mix any of these, which are like our most common drugs kind of out there because benzodiazepines are still popular even when we're getting them from our doctor and alcohol is still king and truly the most insidious gateway drug out there because it kills itself, even just getting sober from alcohol kills. But so whenever we mix any of these substances, we greatly increase our risk for overdose. People also sometimes think you can mix stimulants like meth and cocaine with opioids um, to like counteract the effects, but that actually also increases the risk of overdose. And finally, having a history of overdose or a history of addiction because now, our brains, we have those receptors, right? But our brains are our sneaky creatures and they adapt to survive. If we have way too much of this chemical in our brain all the time, it's gonna be like, okay, I don't need this many receptors and start pruning back receptors. So if you've overdosed before, that's indicative that your brain might be pruning some of those receptors and you may be at heightened risk because you have fewer and fewer receptors to capture that drug. Okay, so this is like the easiest part. I could talk for days about just all of these issues, but the actual how to recognize and respond to an overdose is the super, super easy part. And again, I have a five minute version of this on hierarchiesharmreduction.com and I'll have resources for you at the end so you do not have to remember all of this today. The bottom line, when we're looking for an opioid overdose, this is respiratory depression. Someone has stopped breathing, but we are looking for there is no verbal response. Somebody may still be breathing. They could have shallow, low, weird breathing, uh, irregular or low vitals. It can look anything like a full-blown seizure to somebody is completely blue and dead. Naloxone is so safe that it is completely okay to use it if you are not sure. That is how EMS operates because again, with 
fentanyl overdoses, we've got like two minutes to, to for the average human being to get this chemical administered and reverse the effects of this overdose before that time with lost oxygen can be potentially fatal or just life changing. So really the bottom line is you can't get verbal response from someone no matter how hard you try, but other symptoms could be pinpoint pupils, cool clammy skin, ashy or pale in color, lips and nails can be turning blue that's showing they're not getting enough oxygen, they're not able to talk, they've lost consciousness, body is limp and heavy, slow heart rate or low blood pressure, eyes might be rolling back in the head, but whatever you do, you can't get a response. If you're still unsure, we do what's called the shake, shout, sternum rub method where we shake the person and we shout at them, we say, I'm gonna give you Narcan, I'm calling the cops, because they probably would rather avoid that if they could. Um, and then if all else fails, we take the middle knuckles and you can rub up and down the sternum or above the top lip to check for response. If you still cannot get a verbal communication from someone, it is time to call 911 and uh, use naloxone. Side note, if you do get verbal communication from somebody and they're just chilling, taking a nap, whatever, great, still turn them on their side into the recovery position to prevent them choking on any fluids and keep checking on them every 20 minutes, especially if you know someone's using in a perfect world, they can have a safe adult or a safe person to say, I'm going to take this pill, check on me every 20 minutes, please and thank you. So we do want people to call 911. Um, one thing we deal with a lot in rural communities is how long does it take 911 to get to you because you want to have enough naloxone to fill that time because naloxone may wear off, uh, it will wear off within 30 to 90 minutes. We may need multiple doses of naloxone. That's why the Cloxado was invented because we've heard a lot of reports of people needing five, 10 Narcan doses. Each kit comes with two nasal sprays, whether it's the Cloxado or the Narcan. Each box has all of the instructions on the outside. Um, but again, so I know some people, you know, it could take 20 to 30 minutes for EMS or first responders to get there. Some people, it might take two minutes. Some people might not be comfortable calling 911. So we're Regardless of what your situation is, we want you to have enough naloxone to get you through whatever it is. Um, there's a couple other reasons why it's good to call 911 that I'll talk about in a minute. But if you are administering naloxone, you have ideally called 911. They are on speakerphone. You're going to get a person laying flat on their back. This is the easiest part. Imagine that I've got that beautiful little nasal spray. You get someone laying flat on their back, tilt their head back, insert that into the nose, and plunge. That's it. It's one dose. Do not prime it, put it in the nose, press it, you will feel the plunge, it's kind of a little pressurized aerosol spray, and remove it and throw it away. You can administer another nasal spray into the other nostril. We actually encourage you to give alternating nostrils as many times as necessary every two to three minutes. A lot of times people say, I'm not waiting no two to three minutes because that feels like a long time in this emergency event. Give them 10, it's totally safe, it's okay. Do they need it? Not necessarily. Is it gonna hurt them? Absolutely not. And this is an emergency and you're terrified. I understand that. So it is safe to use multiple doses. Um, but again, the Cloxado is so strong that hopefully it will revive someone. Um, people are revived from naloxone pretty quick. And if they're not breathing or if something's happening in their nasal passages that's obstructing the spray itself from getting up into the airwaves, it might just take a little longer to absorb into the mucous membrane. So I've heard stories of we were walking him into the hospital and, and he came to. So, um, but again, patience may not be a virtue in emergency response. You may provide rescue breathing or CPR in between naloxone doses. I am not a CPR trainer, so that is up to you. You can also put somebody in the recovery position in that two to three minutes in between doses. The bottom line, we wanna try to give people space in between, um, or uh, between the doses, so that when they wake up, they're not like necessarily um, a ton of people right in their face, because sometimes people can react a little volatilely to that situation. So. 
We talked a lot about fentanyl tonight. It can be 100 times stronger than morphine, 50 times stronger than heroin. It can also cause chest rigidity, and so chest compressions may not be effective in the event of a fentanyl overdose. The bottom line, naloxone is the most important component to emergency response and ideally calling 911. Um, we also have had a lot of rumors about fentanyl exposure. I get a lot of questions about this. Um, it is not possible to touch fentanyl and absorb it into your body. I always say, too, that the first step for anyone, myself included, should be to put on gloves before handling any unknown substance regardless. But I always say never say never. Fentanyl is very strong, especially in small spaces. Do what you can to protect yourself and wear personal protective equipment. But you don't need to be worried about providing CPR, providing first response. You can't overdose from giving someone CPR or from touching the fentanyl. So a couple other reasons why it's so important that we call 911, like I said, the naloxone will only last about 30 to 90 minutes, whereas other opioids will last much longer. You can see fentanyl has a pretty short duration of action, but that's for a dose, and that dose is the size of the head of a pencil. So most people who ingest fentanyl have ingested a lot more than a dose. And again, confusion, propaganda, who knows exactly what's happening? I've had friends in Florida and Glenwood Springs be hospitalized for days, receiving naloxone for days because they had a fentanyl overdose. So that's what we were told by their team was that they needed to get naloxone over and over again for three days because that's how much fentanyl they consumed. Another reason why it's important to call 911 and get somebody emergency medical care after an overdose is because, or after receiving naloxone, is because somebody who is opioid dependent will go into withdrawal. This can be really nasty. It can be like the worst flu you've ever had, and people will be pretty uncomfortable. Again, people like why somebody may wake up throwing swings. They also were just dead. They are disoriented. They may be very sick. So we want to give people their space, let them know that they were revived with naloxone and ideally transport them to medical care. Additionally, we do just want to monitor people. So I fully get that not everybody wants to call 911 for these issues, but that's why, and I'll talk about this too, we have laws that exist to protect you, to protect youth, uh, minors, anyone to get help and to call 911 in the event of an overdose. Oh, look at that, there it is, perfect timing. These slides know me so well. So we have a lot of amazing harm reduction legislation in the state of Colorado. This is a 911 Good Samaritan law that states that anyone can call 911 to report a known or suspected overdose and they can't get in trouble for personal possession, intoxication, paraphernalia, um, or even minor in possession of alcohol or substances. Uh, I, am st I have some emails in my inbox about how the Fentanyl Accountability Act will affect this law but it's also very community by community and we are extremely lucky to have Sheriff, Sheriff Fitzsimons in this community because we have a hero and an activist as our sheriff and not every sheriff's department has that um, because we really just want to get people help. We want people to survive rather than necessarily creating a whole mess of problems for them. So every situation is different. If you are out in Denver, it could look very different than if you're in Summit County or even out in Grand Junction. It's just going to look different all over the place. But we do have these laws set up to protect you. The stipulations are that, you know, you have to call 911 to report the overdose. Um, if it's found out that you were with somebody who overdosed, you could potentially get in trouble down the road. Although again, we really just try to work with people and get them the help they need. Um, but you have to stay at the scene and cooperate with law enforcement. And so basically we just you know, want to know what happened to the person, as much information as we can get so that we can know what happened and help them. A couple other great laws that we have. So um, we do have insurance coverage for naloxone. Um, oh, sorry, that's so. We can get naloxone from many pharmacies and have insurance cover part of it, uh, which is part of the standing order laws. But additionally, um, we also have liability protection in Colorado to use naloxone. So anyone can use naloxone, carry it, administer it, give it away to somebody else on anyone of any age without any criminal or civil liability, even if it's expired, period, anywhere. Period. <laughs> you can't get in trouble for using it. You can't hurt somebody. It's better to have it. 
and not need it than to need it and not have it. Um, so again, we have these standing orders and the bulk fund um, and the pharmacist naloxone prescribing that have really just tried to push out having conversations about this, creating ease of access to it. Uh, they, when they started creating these laws, it's like a third party naloxone law. So basically a friend or family member of somebody at risk for an overdose can get naloxone, and I argue that we are all friends and family members of somebody who is at risk for an overdose. I have to remind us that before the fentanyl epidemic, prescription drugs were still responsible for the majority of opioid overdoses in the state of Colorado. So yes, fentanyl is what we're talking about today. Nitazines are just around the corner. Rainbow fentanyl is probably gonna replace the blue perks, and then who knows what's gonna be next? But prescription opioids are still lethal. Real Xanax is still lethal in large amounts. We still need to be taking things exactly as they're prescribed to avoid potential risks. So this is talking a little bit about the Cloxado. Um, there has been some research because uh, people are concerned that it might be too strong, but again, uh, there are very, very minimal risks associated with naloxone. Sometimes I've heard stories of people complaining that naloxone did this or naloxone did that, but again, people receiving naloxone are experiencing an overdose or a seizure or some other like serious medical event that will have serious side effects. So there are no known side effects of naloxone itself, but any um, time without oxygen can be potentially potentially life-changing and life-damaging. So where to get Narcan and Naloxone? Today we have it here for free, which is amazing. Summit County is off the hook and you can get it from the Sheriff's Office. You can get it from Public Health. The schools have it in case of an emergency, which is an amazing, amazing thing and really like front-running stuff. It's super exciting to hear that happening. Um, so like I said, there is a law in Colorado that states that pharmacies can write you a prescription at the pharmacy without like a prior prescription. Not all pharmacies opt into that, but usually the chains do, and we know which ones do here, right? They all have it. They all have it here. Oh, that's amazing. So all the pharmacies, again, Summit County is just off the hook. Um, and you can also ask your doctor. Doctors and pharmacists can write you prescriptions, and most insurances will cover it. I heard that Insurances cover the injectable form. So if you really want the nasal spray and you're having a hard time getting it from your doctor or pharmacist, go to Jamie or Amy. Um, and then we also have harm reduction organizations like myself, High Rockies Harm Reduction. Not only will I be happy to field your questions and conversations in a no questions, totally uh, anonymity private space uh, via email, text message, phone call, whatever, but I also can mail supplies, no questions asked. Um, so if you, for whatever reason, don't feel like going into the sheriff's office, we can mail supplies too. And we also have the Colorado Bulk Fund, so organizations and really even individuals can apply to access free naloxone from the state. So I get free naloxone from the state, I pass it on to you, but if you need more than 12, I would love to hook you up with the two Google Doc links that will allow you to access the Bulk Fund for yourself. We were talking about this before we started. Truly, anyone is eligible to get free naloxone for the state and I can help you with, through that process if you're interested and they do it very case by case so we encourage everyone to apply if interested. OP Rescue, this is an amazing app. I strongly encourage people who are very passionate about these issues to download OP Rescue because you can get everything you got today. You can recognize how uh, what an overdose looks like, how to respond. You can report reverse overdoses and you can also find local substance abuse resources. There's also the Bring Naloxone Home campaign. The Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug, soon to be misuse, um, does a lot of amazing work and a lot of amazing campaigns. They also have the takemedseriously.org and again, your sheriff's department does drug take backs all the time. Um, so final, oh, I'll go back real quick just to say we've got some great, uh, in between me and Dr. Rob are Lindsay and Jessica, our amazing external strategists. So you've got lots of resources for more information about all these issues locally and statewide. So the most important things, naloxone will not work on other drug overdoses. It will only work on opioids, but that's why it's all the more relevant because fentanyl is an opioid and it's in everything. Nitazines are opioids and they're in everything. We've seen other drugs called pyros. Opioids are very insidious, and so if we don't know what's happening, it is safe to try naloxone because there could be opioid contamination. The one caveat with naloxone is that we like to keep it room temperature, but there have been a lot of studies with alternating heat. Again, there is uh, an 
addition to that law that um, protects you from liability for using it, that even if it's expired, because even if it's been sitting in your car for five years and it's expired, it's still better than nothing to try. Although I try not to leave it in my car in Rocky Mountain weather. Um, we want to keep it at room temperature, but even if it's been frozen, there are instructions on each kit for how to thaw it out. So I was telling a lot of people what to do during Burning Man, where it was going to be 110 degrees. Better to put it in a cooler. Better to store on the cool side than the excessive heat side. And really, you know, this is a scary issue, but this is an amazing tool. Like, very rarely before have we ever had a resource that's like, oh, that thing that's killing hundreds of thousands of Americans every year, this will stop that. This will reverse that. If we get to people on time, if we carry this with every AED and every first aid box and every nurse's office, we can prevent those. I firmly believe we can get our rural overdose data numbers to zero because we have these tools, because we have these people, because we have these resources and these collaborations and these conversations. So people are nervous, but the number one thing is like, you can do this. <laughs> and studies have shown that just by sitting through this training, and actually you guys have gotten a lot more, I think, than I usually do, you're just as prepared as any medical professional to respond to an overdose. And you have a lot of tools and resources in your pocket, myself and everyone here today. So I'm going to stop because, again, I could just keep going. But it's super honor and pleasure to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, always fun to listen to you talk and hear your passion. I'm going to bring up Laura Landrum, who's here from Building Hope, to talk about some local resources. Yes, you can just send a little advance your slide. Awesome. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura. Uh, I'm a social worker with Building Hope, um, and I also work with teens in the county as well. Um, I would like to echo a lot of the, the statements that have been made tonight, especially just that. Um, Teens are doing whatever they want, <laughs> whenever they want. I know if you're a parent of a teen, you're like, I know, because it's happening. But um, so just having those conversations is very, very important. And I also just want to echo that um, here in Summit County, we are working really, really hard uh, to, to put behavioral health, so mental health and substance use disorder treatment at the forefront. Um, through partnerships with Building Hope, with uh, Public Health, with the Sheriff's Office. Um, Lots of great stuff is happening. If you have any questions about that specifically, just come ask me. I'm happy to talk. Um, so here in Summit, or well, generally, um, we have multiple steps of treatment for folks who are suffering from substance use disorders, including opioid use disorders. Um, folks can get medi uh, medication-assisted treatment. You'll hear it called MAT treatment. We have a couple of places that you can go in the county for that that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, typically, for folks who become opioid dependent, the um, most efficacious, the, the best treatment is both MAT treatment with psychotherapy, so having someone talk about their feelings while they're also taking a, a substance to treat the physical signs of withdrawal. Um, because like Maggie and some other folks have said, um, you, you know, coming through withdrawal from, from opioids just makes you feel really bad. And so sometimes, you know, taking Suboxone or, or Methadone or something like that helps manage those physical symptoms so you can actually stay sober. Um, we also, we here in Summit County, everyone can access mental health therapy if they want. Um, you can call us at Building Hope. You can call our friends at the FERC. Um, if you ever meet with the SMART team, you can get a, a scholarship for therapy and or be connected via your insurance. Um, if you don't have insurance or you don't want to use your insurance, that's not a problem. Building Hope scholarships will cover your therapy up to 12 free sessions, and we'll go, we'll go beyond that if you, if you want more, if you or your team want more. Um, we do have peer support groups. Um, we have some specific groups here in the county just for substance use disorders. Um, and there's also Narcotics Anonymous here in the county that meets three times a week at Agape. Um, we don't have inpatient rehab here in the county, but we can get you connected with one if, if you do decide that that is right for you or right for your family member. Um, and then there's also intensive outpatient treatment um, that can be accessed online. We have women's recovery up here in Summit County that is a female-specific substance use disorder in, uh, intensive outpatient treatment. Usually what that looks like is multiple days a week for multiple hours. Um, so you're still living at home and everything, but you're, you're getting a good amount of therapy. Um, Again, these are, I, I'm sure these slides will be made accessible, but here are lots of different ways that you can receive treatment in Summit County. I know it's kind of hard to start to read. 
Um, but you'll see the SMART team is on there. Uh, we also have um, NAMI, we have Alcoholics Anonymous, we have Building Hope, lots of great services. Um, so really, really exciting here in the county. <laughs> just opened, we cut the ribbon yesterday. We have the Summit Wellness Hub. Uh, it is in the medical office building. It's across the hall from the Summit Community Care Clinic, our federally qualified health care center. Um, in the hub, you can receive that medication-assisted treatment, MAT treatment, um, through Front Range Clinic. You can also, oops, sorry. Uh, you can also receive outpatient treatment from Mile High Behavioral Health. Um, if you or your loved one says, you know, no, I don't want to talk about my feelings. They can just engage with MAP treatment through Front Range Clinic. Although, like I said, I would highly, highly recommend that if they are um, suffering from an opioid use disorder that they also engage in psychotherapy. Um, I can also say with full confidence the folks working in that office are really wonderful, lovely human beings who are happy to talk through whatever options um, you or your loved one might need. Um, we do also have uh, MAP treatment at the Summit Community Care Clinic as well. Um, so if you or your loved one is looking for more integrated care, that physical, mental, wellness, all of those pieces, um, you can also go to the care clinic. Um, the care clinic does have a sliding scale fee um, and they do accept Medicaid and they'll work with you um, to, to get you the care that you need if, if, that's, if that's what you're looking for. I, we also have school-based health here in the schools. Um, so if you, as a family member, you have access to school-based health through the care clinic here in the schools, um, as well as your children, um, just a heads up, your kids can also consent to uh, psychotherapy starting at the age of about 12. So if your kid, you know, is like, you know, mom, dad, I don't want to talk to you about this, um, you can still offer them the support. Like, hey, do you want to go maybe talk to Marissa at school-based health in the care clinic? Um, Marissa's really wonderful. Shout out to Marissa, the therapist in the care clinic here in the school. Um, you can also see a couple of these resources that I discussed. Um, AA meetings, NA meetings, Summit, uh, Summit Women's Recovery. We do have clinical withdrawal management here in the county. So if you or your loved one is intoxicated um, and is you know, unsafe, for any reason, um, they can go to that facility. Um, it's 24 seven, it's fully staffed, and, and they can have a safe place to, to come down where they're you know, still in the medical office building. If they need further health care, it's right there. Um, this is the Summit Wellness Hub <laughs> logo. Um, we do offer Fit to Recover classes. One of our wonderful um, members of, this, of the SMART team clinicians, he's one of the, the Fit to Recover coaches. He's very into it. His name's Andrew, if you, if you ever end up going. Um, I have gone. It's very hard. You run a lot. <laughs> but it's fine. Um, it is a space, though. Uh, anybody who is sober, actively sober at the time of the class, is welcome to join. Um, so I don't necessarily consider myself someone in recovery, but I am working towards being a licensed addiction counselor. Um, so I work with some folks in recovery, and, and I've gone to the class before just to see what it's like. I've gone with folks just to be like, hey, maybe you'll like this thing, and it can be a, a fun space for you. Um, so would highly recommend uh, Jared and Tennille, who run CrossFit Low Oxygen, are very, very passionate about behavioral health as well. Um, we have uh, an article about them on the Building Hope website if you ever want to read it. Um, and then we also have Walking Away from Substance Shame, which is a free group for folks who, if they are interested in um, in a peer support, well, it's, it's facilitated by um, a licensed therapist, uh, but it is a group for folks who are, who are in recovery or working towards being in recovery. Um, and it is free to everyone in the county. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. No worries. Thank you so much, Laura. I know we're running late. Um, I appreciate everyone who stayed uh, this evening. I do want to just mention through our youth and family uh, department and services, we do offer other trainings and support for families here locally. We have positive youth development trainings, trusted adult or askable adult trainings, uh, mental health first aid for youth, and a parent toolkit on youth vaping uh, that is specific to Summit County Vaping Sucks uh, that was that was created with youth in our community. So it and it also has won an award. So check it out. It's a great resource for all of you. We would love it if you could uh, scan this QR code. It's a survey, very short survey. If we can make this presentation better, if we can talk more about other things, what 
was helpful, what wasn't helpful, we would love to hear about that. Um, we do have naloxone on your way out. We also have COVID tests. If you would like to take some for the cold and flu season, they're there for you uh, to take as well. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Um, it's always great to present with such passionate people and let's go save some lives. Thanks. <laughs>